there is a plan to build a single energy project with 70 gigawatts of generating capacity. That is more power than all of Australia's main power grid combined. It's called the Western Green Energy Hub, a $100 billion project set for a remote corner of Australia. The plan includes 3,000 massive wind turbines and 60 million solar panels. But this project won't be powering homes. It will be used to create 5.4 million tonnes of green hydrogen every year, all built on a patch of desert larger than many European countries. But how do you build a high-tech energy city in one of the most remote, fragile and empty places on Earth? And how do you convince the people who have protected that land for 60,000 years to let you? That engineering and human challenge is what makes this one of the most complex mega-builds ever attempted. The Western Green Energy Hub, or WGEH, isn't just a normal project. It was born from a completely new way of thinking. The entire project is located in the far southeast of Western Australia, on the traditional lands of the Murning people. In 2017, the Australian Federal Court legally recognised the Murning's native title rights to this land. This means the project cannot happen without them. So the developers, Intercontinental Energy and CWP Global, didn't just ask for permission. They formed a partnership. They created a new company, Murning Green Energy Limited, which is owned by the Murning traditional owners. This new company was given a 10% equity stake in the entire $100 billion project. This is a free carried interest stake which means the Murning people did not have to pay for it. Even more important, the Murning have a permanent, guaranteed seat on the project's main board of directors. They have a real voice in every decision, from engineering to environmental protection, and the agreement gives them the option to secure a majority ownership stake in the project in 50 years. This is a level of partnership almost never seen in a project of this size, it redefines the relationship between developers and First Nations owners. This unique agreement unlocked one of the most powerful and empty places on the planet. But to understand why they chose this specific spot, you have to look at the sky. The plan for the WGEH is divided into three main engineering stages. Upstream, midstream and downstream. Upstream is the power generation. This is the part that rewrites the record books the total project area, or development envelope, that the WGEH has access to is massive. It covers 2.27 million hectares, or 22,690 square kilometres. To give you an idea of that size, the entire country of Wales is smaller, at just over 20,700 square kilometres. But here is the most important engineering detail. They are not paving this entire area. The plan is to use this vast space to spread the infrastructure out, avoiding sensitive environmental and cultural sites. The total permanent clearing for all 3,000 turbines, 35 solar farms, roads and buildings is estimated to be just 10,724 hectares. That means 99.5% of this vast landscape will be left undisturbed. The reason they need all this space is for the upstream hardware. First, the solar. The plan calls for 35 massive solar farms, using a total of around 60 million individual solar panels. Then, the wind. The plan includes approximately 3,000 wind turbines. These are not the turbines you see on a hillside. These are next-generation giants. Some reports suggest they could be 20 megawatt turbines. The largest onshore turbines being built today have rotor diameters over 260 meters and can stand taller than a skyscraper. Just one of these giant machines can power thousands of homes. The WGEH will build 3,000 of them, carefully spaced 1.5 to 2.5 kilometers apart to catch the wind. This hardware is designed to capture the site's most valuable asset, its optimal diurnal profile. That's a technical term for a perfect 24-hour cycle of power. Here's what it means. This part of Australia has very high-quality sun, so during the day, the 60 million solar panels will be generating a massive amount of electricity. But at night, the sun goes down, and that's when the diurnal pattern kicks in. As the land cools, powerful consistent winds sweep across the plains. The wind blows hard precisely when the sun isn't shining. This hybrid design creates a smooth, incredibly reliable, 24-hour wave of green power. This 24-7 power is the project's secret weapon. 
a hydrogen factory is extremely expensive. You can't just turn it off every night. To be profitable, it must run constantly. And this location, with its perfect wind and solar tag team, provides that constant power. But this creates the project's first great engineering challenge. You have 70 gigawatts of power, again more than all of Australia's main grid, spread out over 22,000 square kilometres. How do you collect it all? Moving that much electricity over copper wires would be incredibly expensive and inefficient. You would lose a huge amount of power just in heat. So this is where the midstream stage begins. The engineer's solution is brilliant. Don't move the electricity, convert it. Instead of one giant central factory, the WGEH will be a distributed network. The plan is to build the project in modular stages, using something they call the node concept. Here is how it works. They will group the wind and solar farms into clusters. Each cluster will produce about 2 gigawatts of renewable power. Then, right in the middle of that 2 gigawatt power cluster, they will build a 1 gigawatt hydrogen factory, or node. This is a patented system. The electricity from the turbines and panels travels only a short distance to its local node. This design eliminates the need for thousands of kilometers of expensive long-distance power lines. It's estimated to be 10% cheaper and 10% more efficient. Inside each node, that one gigawatt of power is fed into a suite of electrolyzers. An electrolyzer is a machine that does one simple thing. It splits water, H2O, into its two parts, hydrogen, H2, and oxygen, O. The oxygen is released and the hydrogen is captured as a clean fuel. Because this process is powered only by wind and solar, the product is called green hydrogen. So now you don't have a grid of power lines. You have 35 separate factories, all making hydrogen gas. The new challenge is collecting the gas. To solve this, WGEH will build a massive grid of pipelines. These pipelines will connect all 35 nodes, collecting the pure hydrogen gas and transporting it. These pipelines also act as a form of storage, holding the energy within the gas itself. All these pipes flow to one central location on the coast, where the final downstream stage begins. This is where the project becomes three more mega-projects, all built at the same time. To get this energy from the desert to the rest of the world, they must build a water factory, a chemical factory, and a brand new port. First, the water factory. The electrolyzers in the desert need millions of tons of water to split into hydrogen. But this is the Nullarbor, one of the driest places on Earth. The only water is the Southern Ocean. The plan calls for a massive desalination plant to be built on the coast. This plant will suck in seawater and use a process called reverse osmosis to create the ultra-pure water needed for electrolysis. At full scale, this plant will be able to produce 80 gigalitres of fresh water every year. That number is hard to picture. A standard Olympic swimming pool holds 2.5 million litres, or 2.5 megalitres. An 80 gigalitre plant can produce enough fresh water to fill 32,000 Olympic swimming pools every single year. This fresh water will be pumped from the coast back inland to the 35 hydrogen nodes. Second, the chemical factory. Now they have 5.4 million tonnes of green hydrogen gas. But you can't just put hydrogen gas in a boat. As a gas, it takes up too much space. To transport it as a liquid, you have to keep it at minus 253 degrees Celsius. This is incredibly difficult and expensive, so they convert it into something easier to ship. Green ammonia. At a huge processing facility on the coast, they will take the green hydrogen, H2, and combine it with nitrogen, N2, pulled directly from the air. This creates ammonia, or NH3. This process will turn the 5.4 million tons of hydrogen into 30 million tons of green ammonia every year. Why ammonia? Because it is liquid at just minus 33 degrees Celsius. This is much, much easier and safer to transport. It's a chemical that is already shipped all over the world. Third, the brand new port. This remote coastline has no ports. You can't build a 70 gigawatt project with trucks. You need giant cargo ships. But you can't just build a pier out into the rough southern ocean. So the plan has two parts. To bring in the 3,000 turbine blades, the solar panels and the factory parts, they will build a marine offloading facility, or MOF. 
The engineering plans show this isn't a simple pier. They will actually dig a new harbour into the coastline. It is described as an excavated basin. They will dredge a deep channel from the sea and carve out a large protected basin in the land, shielding it with breakwaters. This will create a calm water harbour for cargo ships to safely unload the thousands of massive components. To ship the green ammonia out, they will build a different system. A subsea pipeline will be built, running from the ammonia storage tanks on shore out along the ocean floor. This pipeline will extend several kilometers out to a mono tower or a buoy system anchored in deep water. Giant ammonia tankers, some as large as 125,000 tons, will moor to this buoy, hook up a flexible hose, and load the 30 million tons of green ammonia for export to countries like South Korea and Japan. But this $100 billion dream is still just a plan. It is a 30-year, seven-stage project. The project is still moving through environmental approvals. The final go button for just stage one, the final investment decision, is not expected until 2029, with first production hopefully starting in 2032. And it faces massive criticism. First, the cost. Today, green hydrogen is still far more expensive to make than hydrogen from fossil fuels. The project's success depends on government subsidies, like Australia's new $2 per kilogram tax credit, to make it work. Second, the environmental impact. That 80 gigaliter desalination plant will create a toxic waste product. 110 gigaliters of super salty brine, which will be dumped back into the ocean every year. Finally, the engineering. Critics point out that this land is cast, a porous limestone geology. Building 3,000 skyscraper-sized turbines on this ground is a massive and unproven geological challenge. So what do you think? Is the Western Green Energy Hub the blueprint for the future of energy? Or is it a $100 billion green fantasy? Let us know in the comments. If you love learning about the biggest projects on Earth, Make sure to like this video and subscribe to Ultimate Mega Builds. Don't forget to turn on notifications so you never miss an upload.